Hello everyone. Today I'm going to take you to work with me. Since I'm an airline pilot, I'm traveling around the country and I have lots of San Francisco layovers. So this time I'm going to visit a submarine and I'm going to travel some old machinery like this cable car, what we are on right now. We are heading to the Fisherman's Wharf where we're going to find that World War II submarine and take a tour on it. After that, we're going to take a trip on one of these really old 1960s trams or city cars back to the hotel. At home in Kentucky, I was working on my Corvair van, but it's got too cold in the barn. So I picked up some extra trips to make some money for more parts while uh, it's getting a little warmer back in Kentucky. But it's a really nice day here in San Francisco. So we're going to hop off this uh, cable car, which, by the way, was made... Uh, started to started service back in the 1800s to uh, replace horsed carriages and then the uh, city lovingly restored it uh, the last time they restored it, it was the mid 80s but here's everyone getting off of it and then uh, while we're here we're gonna stop and look at the gas prices the gas price is almost the most expensive one in California because they have so much tax on it they, they overtax everyone in California so um, you can see the regular is uh, five dollars and eighty cents and then so on but those octane numbers were not totally like in Europe and look at look at what we have here a BMW it's a it's a little bit worn I got I had one of these sidecars before I sold it but I, has, I have two more sidecars which I need to put next to my Simpsons so this BMW looks like it's in uh -huh. I don't know if it's original condition it's it's kind of beat up and banged up so I try to think that maybe it's in original condition but at least it costs a lot of money uh, look at that they want like 25,000 for it yeah I don't know how much one of these costs in the EU but um, yeah that sounds a lot of money to me <laughs> but you can buy everything here there's a little gift store so there's all kind of interesting stuff but you can knock yourself out on so here this is the fisherman's wharf um, it really is a tourist trap. There's all kind of restaurants here which, which were selling supposedly original fish food from the area, but I'm pretty sure it came from China or somewhere else. Some guy is uh, unhooking his uh, music uh, equipment because he's going to start playing some <coughs> really annoying songs to, songs to everyone. And then we're going to have lunch at that, uh, at that restaurant right straight ahead. We're going to have some fish and chips. Well, let's go find that submarine. Don't forget that mother man. Baby, kiss me. On December 7th, 1941, the Japanese Imperial Army attacked the United States of America at Pearl Harbor. After this, uh, the United States got into the war and started a, uh, a submarine program. And this particular submarine was built in 1943 in New Hampshire. It was uh, a big change in the youth lives where uh, one day they were playing basketball or baseball in their backyard and then the next day they were on this uh, incredible machinery. They were dealing with torpedoes like what you see here. We're going to see a couple more inside the submarine. The su survival rate was about 76% on these submarines and these kids had no idea where they were going. The only thing they knew that they were heading to the uh, USS Pompanito and that's where they're going to serve with 84 other men and the whole submarine only had four very public bathroom. So they had four diesel engines and an electrical motor and it's always ran on the electric motor. The question is where the electricity came from, from the diesel generators or the batteries. Meanwhile, they had to think about these uh, exploding mines, what the other ships were throwing down at them. Here's a nice big blade from the back. It's all made out of brass. And here's one cell of uh, battery, which there are a whole bunch of them inside the submarine. So they were always either charging these batteries with the diesel engines or they used the battery power out of this battery. Well, let's head on and, and look, let's get inside that submarine.
this opening used to be a torpedo loading hatch. So they made it for us to safely can enter the submarine, even at, <laughs> at an older age. Um, this is the torpedo room. The torpedo guys were actually sleeping here. At this time, they had two different kind of torpedoes. One was the uh, electric torpedo, which was the Mark 18. It was able to do 29 knots. It was super quiet. There was no bubbles. And it was a little slower, but it was a lot more uh, stealth. The other one was a steam-powered torpedo, the Mark 14 and the 31. They were, about, they were able to do 46 knots, but since the steam was coming out, the other uh, uh, ship that was getting torpedoed, they were able to detect it or see it and hear it that it was coming. This is where they were loading them up. Once they loaded them up, they added a whole bunch of uh, uh, compressed air, and the compressed air actually pushed the tor torpedo out from the uh, bay. And there were all kind of things what you had to set up on the torpedo. So in the front of the torpedo, there was a little propeller. And that propeller was basically a timer. And you had to set up that timer when to make the explosion happen. So the people who ran the torpedo bay, they actually lived with the torpedoes. And there was a torpedo bay on the front and in the back. So conveniently located. So if they had to shoot something to the back or to the front, they didn't have to turn the whole thing around. They were just able to shoot to the back and then get out of the way and wait for the boom. On these submarines, the space was at a premium, so they had to use every available little cubby hole to put either a very public toilet or a sink or some sort of other device or a storage room or something there. You can see the double props uh, as they are on the torpedoes, whatever, propelling it forward. And of course, it was a really hot place. The, hot, the heat came from the diesel engines. Where we're getting in right now, this was the setup. So the captain was advising the, uh, the engine room to adjust what to do with the, uh, uh, so when to use electricity, how much to charge the batteries, um, how fast to go, and all these things. So there were four engines, four diesel engines in the submarine, and those diesel engines can be used to uh, generate power and recharge the batteries or put all the uh, generated power to the propeller in the back and run the electric motor in the back to propel the whole vessel forward. So we could say that this is where the magic happened. They had to manipulate all these levers and, uh, and look at all these gauges to, to make the desired outcome. So I'm pretty sure that was a learning curve for the crew to learn it and it was probably uh, a, a very skilled task what they had to do for it, to do make, ha make it happen. Remember when this submarine got into service right after the war, when actually they actually used this submarine, it was a brand new equipment, so everything was nice and new. It looks like there's a lathe machine here to be able to do small repairs while at sea. They, they stationed two crews here to, uh, to make this work. So if they went under and only used the batteries, the submarine was able to do nine knots and it was, a, it was a maximum speed for one hour. If they went slower, they were able to stay below the surface for a longer time. If they went up to the surface, they were able to do 21 knots and they had two prop propellers to propel the whole thing forward. At the end of the war, the US Navy captured a U-2 submarine, a German submarine too. And the Germans were trying to pull the plug on it at the bottom, but they kind of prevented that and dragged the submarine back into the port. And then it actually ended up in Chicago. And then they pulled it on the shore in Chicago and they built a nice building around it, cut a huge hole on the side. So I guess you can't use the submarine anymore. And it's displayed there. And uh, I've been there before, but at that time I didn't really take any videos. So I kind of planning on going back there, the uh, Museum of the Natural Science, and then take a video of that submarine and may maybe compare the two submarines, how did they look, but I have a feeling that it looks very similar. They have all these uh, levers. I guess with this, uh, you can see the pressure in the other room once you uh, lock the door, and they were able to uh, lock the door. This is the engine room, by the way, but uh, um, if you look behind us, we can see how they, they had that door lockable. So it has a big seal, and then they were able to uh, separate the two compartments from each other if they had any kind of damage. And they were able to see the, the pressure uh, behind the door. And what this big brass, I, I just don't know. So here are the engines. There are four engines on board. They called the uh, 38DA. They were 10-cylinder engines, diesel engines. 
They had a crankshaft on the top and on the bottom. And as the two pistons came together, that's where the explosion happened. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's pretty mind-boggling to me. Uh, that was a, a really new technology, I guess, at that time. But uh, I don't think I've seen any kind of vehicles other than a submarine engine that had this uh, upper and lower crankshaft. Here is the adjusting this thing. You can put it to run, start, or stop. And it was really super loud in here. The people who were working here, they couldn't talk to each other, so they had to use hand signals to actually talk to each other. I like anything what moves. I like airplanes, I like cars, and I guess I like submarines too. I'm just really happy that I don't have to work on one. I just, uh, it's really hard to even imagine what these uh, kids went through when they were, uh, when they were served on these submarines on both sides of the war. I'm not just talking about the Americans, but also the, uh, the uh, Japanese or the uh, German sides as well. As we continue on, there is some access hatch on the top of the submarine where uh, you're able to get some new fresh air coming in, but that was, it was not much. But these engines were generating so much heat that uh, it was really, really hot and, and humid most of the time. So when they finally turned the engines off, there was a little break for the crew, but uh, sometimes they actually, uh, the reason why they turned it off and the reason why they had to dive to get away from uh, getting detected. So then, the, instead of getting a really real break, they were all totally scared of like, okay, what's gonna happen now? Who's gonna bomb us now from up above? You can see here is the uh, manufacturer plate. At this time period, the United States manufactured most of the goods for the, for the world, actually. So they manufactured a whole bunch of machinery, very large quantities. So they were pushing these uh, submarine engines out like no tomorrow. They carried some spare parts. So if there were some uh, minor defects on these engines, they were able to do the repairs at sea. But um, if something major happened, they just were able to just disregard one engine and then use the other three. And then when they got back into the port, they, ca they were able to make uh, repairs. There are lots of parts of a submarine. So there's all kind of things. Uh, could fail. So you can imagine if you have a brand new RV, how many things on that RV will break even if it's brand new. So now think about a submarine, a complex machine like this. So it really had to perform quite well. When I was growing up, I was watching all these movies with these uh, war stories and submarines. So it's to me, it's very excited to be here and see all these things where I have no clue what they're showing you and, and just kind of guessing what they're showing you or, or what you can do with them. I assume for the people who actually work on these, it was not as fun as for, for us to walk around on this. As we're going through this next hatch, you can see the laundry room. So they were actually be able to uh, cook and do laundry on the, on the ship. So if they were out at sea, you're able to wash your stuff here. There's a, there's a, a laundry machine and actually there is a press on top of it where you're able to, that was the dryer basically, where you're able to dry it up. I guess there was no problem with the heat inside the sub. So um, yeah, as we're going forward, uh, these were uh, warm beds. So at one point of time, somebody was sleeping in that bed. Once that person got out of it, another one got in. So the bed was still warm. <laughs> so there is not too much space on a submarine. So they had to utilize the space uh, uh, very carefully. So somebody was always sleeping. Now here is a community room where they were able to get a cup of coffee, play some games you can see on the table. They have those permanent uh, uh, game uh, boards. And then it was right next to the kitchen. And here's a motivating picture to think about the back home and to have something to think about when they go to sleep. So this was the area where the regular sailors were uh, kind of had a community place to get together and talk about stuff and here was the kitchen and in the kitchen the cook was working for, um, from early morning to late night and at night time the other baker came who was baking bread and pastries so it was a 24 7 operations and they said that in the whole army the whole military uh, setup the best food was on the submarine now we're stepping into the control room there was a coding machine in uh, that was in the in this room on the left and there was an ECM Mark II. This was pretty much their Enigma machine. So that's how they received and sent uh, coded messages back and forth. And just to be specific, the Enigma machine was the uh, German uh, coding machine, which was a really hard, to, uh, hard code to crack, but finally they did it by the end of the war. So this place is pretty much at the middle of the submarine. So there was a tower on top of this room, and that's where the two periscopes were. Below it, 
um, you're going to look into that hatch. Below this room was the pumping room where they're pumping out the excess of water what seeped in. They had two uh, radars, SJ radars, and they had sonars. The sonar was uh, further up. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about this a little later. The submarine was actually uh, certified to 450 feet under the water maximum, but they actually went lower than that. The periscope depth was 60 feet. And when it was a normal dive, they did a 12% or 12 degrees or, or 15 degrees dive, and they were able to see, able to see uh, and, and adjust that from here. But there were different sounds, different alarms that went out to the crew. For, ex for instance, the, uh, the, the instantaneous uh, emergency dive sounded like the uh, horn on my Model T. That was a very similar sound to it. But there were other sounds also. Um, when they had to uh, dive uh, in a hurry. The way the submarine dove, it was uh, basically they let air out from certain ballast, ballast tanks and the air was replaced by water and therefore the buoyancy changed and therefore the whole thing went uh, lower and lower. So when they wanted to come up, wanted to rise, they actually put compressed air into those balanced tanks and that will create buoyancy and then they start coming up. The reason why this whole room is red, because they wanted to protect the night vision of the crew who actually looked outside and not through the window because there were no windows as you've seen, but through the periscopes or maybe if they went upstairs and they went outside and they were used binoculars to trying to uh, find enemy ships. So they wanted to protect the crew's night vision because your, your eyes will uh, take 30 minutes to adjust to the, uh, to the, to the to the darkness. So this room was usually uh, in this kind of lighting. Now we're heading over to the uh, officers quarters. They had a secretary, there was a station on the right here, and then they had their own kitchen, they had their own kitchen staff who actually grabbed the food from the regular kitchen and brought them, brought them over whatever they wanted. And then uh, they, were, they had uh, significantly more space to live than the rest of the crew. But even though they're like, these are really tight, I mean, they still are still on a diesel submarine, so there were not too much space for anybody. So I guess it's really hard to imagine, never see the sun, and you don't know what time of a day it is. And But the time is keep rolling forward. There's always get some excitement where you can see some other enemy ships, or you have to dive in a hurry, or, um, yeah, so I'm pretty sure they will come when they get into the port. This is the officers club. They had some basic kitchen, but the uh, extra stuff, if they wanted something extra, they brought it over from the other kitchen. But they still, they were not uh, all that luxurious uh, accommodations, but compared to the rest of the crew, I guess it was a very different place to be. If you ever come to visit this uh, submarine, I recommend to use the uh, audible guide, which uh, I listen to, and that's how I know their stories, what they were talking about, and know the specifics of the submarine. Now we're getting into the other side of the torpedo bay. Basically, there was a torpedo bay where we started, and here is another one. So this is the other end of the submarine. Here's the shower. You can see the shower and a very public uh, toilet again. So, yeah, you had to really leave your, uh, your shyness at home. And you really had to, uh, you know, basically just go with the flow and then just do what needs to be done. So one of the stories was talk about the depth charges. They were basically dropping bombs from the uh, ships and then at certain depths they were exploding and they, when they were exploding next to the submarine, the, the, uh, uh, the eyewitness was saying that there were not too many atheists around the submarine at that point of time. So here's a dissected torpedo so you can see all the mechanics and uh, the, the, uh, the how it was set up. So I assume this was a steam torpedo but I really don't know but you know the options were either an electric or a steam torpedo and they were actually had these hangers and on the hangers they uh, moved it over to that uh, torpedo uh, bay I would say and then they closed the lid on it and activated the compressed air and then the compressed air pushed it out to the outside I guess it big enough for someone to climb in there was some movies about that when they were trying to get up to the surface from a broken submarine and then somebody was escaping through the hatch. I remember some really well-made movies about submarines, like the dust boat was one of them. 
and then some other more modern movies as well so if you have nothing better to do i recommend <laughs> watch some submarine movies but uh here's this makeshift uh stairway so we're gonna get out and go up to the surface again again these uh these little levers were manipulating uh all these uh torpedo launching equipment so again, these stairways, what we're going to leave this uh, submarine with by, they were not part of the submarine when it was in service. Um, these, are, these stairways were actually made for us to be able to enter and exit. This was a torpedo loading hatch, and they expanded that and made it to actual a stairway. As we're coming out, you're going to see the upper deck where people were able to move on, and there was a uh, space between the deck and the... Uh, submarine there is the pressure hatch what you can see and there were all kind of bottles around located around what we're able to get the air out and put water in or get the water out with with compressed air and therefore create buoyancy and then that's why the uh, that's how the whole vessel came up onto the surface back to the modern world world about the uh, end of the 1990s I used to live on an island called Saipan Island. It's the a part of the Northern Marianas, north of Guam, south of Japan. And then we had some times when the uh, nuclear subs actually uh, docked uh, at the dock. And the reason the locals and us were able to tell that there is a submarine just docked because there was a whole bunch of very white guys were running around the rental scooters on the whole island. So then we knew like, okay, there was a submarine just docked because all these uh, kids are running around. They were super white. I guess they very rarely seen the sun. This particular submarine was mostly uh, moved around in the uh, Pacific region. And we can't really separate the uh, European theater from the Pacific theater. So I had some stories from both ends. My, my, I'm from Hungary, and my grandpa was in the European theater, and then he was telling me all kind of war stories. And I also spent a lot of time on Saipan and Tinian Island, where the B-29s took off to, towards Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And I met with the, uh, some of the crew who actually flew those airplanes, airplanes. So I got some stories about that at a later program I'm probably going to I'll tell you what I learned because I met with a guy who dropped the nuclear bomb. I also met with a guy who actually seen it exploding. So that's another story for another day. But now that we are done with this visit, I hope you guys enjoyed that submarine visit. Now we're going to go out and uh, see if we can find some lunch. Let's just pretend that we just docked with our submarine and then uh, we are good to go for a, for a leave a 24-hour leave to the fisherman's wharf. <laughs> so here's that restaurant where I'm thinking I'm going to get lunch. So we're going to go over there. It looks like there are a bunch of seagulls are already eating. So let's see what they eat. And then we're going to get probably the same thing because if it's good for the seagulls, I think it's going to be good for me. I keep seeing two different uh, versions of the seagulls. One is the uh, the grayish and the other one is the totally white seagull so i don't know what the i'm not an ornithologist so i really don't know what the difference between the two seagulls but they are the one who are uh, uh, really not scared of people and then running around and trying to you know find some food they kind of opportunistic animals So here's a quick uh, look at the menu. It's not all that particularly expensive. So um, everything is really expensive in San Francisco because they have to pay an incredible amount of taxes for their own state and then to the city and so on. So um, I really like the, uh, the clam chatter in that, in that bowl, like in the uh, bread bowl, and then probably going to get some fish and chips. Meanwhile, there are some uh, motorcycle club uh, stop by. So you can see they are custom-built motorcycles. I asked them if I can take some video of them. I, I only have a couple motorcycles. I got a 1959 Simpson, uh, and then I got a, a Schwalbe, and I got a Vespa from 1964. And also, I, I also have a jet-powered bicycle, but all those motorcycles are a totally different category than these ones. So I got the food. Well, it's not as exciting, but um, that's the local food, so I guess I'm going to try it. So it's uh, fish and chips and calm cheddar and then uh, ginger ale from Canada Dry. And then uh, once we're done with this, then uh, we're going to go find that vintage tram, that vintage city car. 
In the 1980s, the cable car needed a total restoration, so they had to dig up all the uh, equipment for the cable car, and they had to re restore the whole system. So at that time, uh, the cable car was closed for a long time. So the city was thinking, what else can they do to, uh, to attract tourism, and what else can they do to make the city nicer while they're working on the cable car? So then they decided to buy these really vintage uh, trams from all around the country and restore them and uh, basically make them a working machine. So these are actually running. You can buy a ticket on it, you can sit on it and ride on it just like a long time ago. So um, they were able to find all kind of trams for all around the country, in fact all around the world because they have a couple of trams from Europe and they restored those very nicely. They bought a couple of wooden trams, electric tram cars from the uh, city of uh, Milano. And this, co this car actually from San Francisco from the 60s, every one of these left in their original paint job. It is a not original paint, but they repainted them the way they appeared when they were new. So this next one is from the uh, Baltimore transit system. So this one is from uh, Baltimore. And at that time period, they had the, uh, when, it, when this tram was new, they had it painted uh, just the same paint scheme as, it, as you can see it right now. So they have several different versions of these. Some came from San Diego, some came from Pittsburgh, and then they all actually uh, very nicely done inside. They did some improvements, like those lights in their ceiling are LED lights. And then in the uh, front where the uh, conductor sits, that there were some improvements or modernization, but they, uh, they're actually running very well. So now we're going to take a ride in them and then head back to the hotel. This is a more vintage part of the uh, San Francisco Bay. And then these are really old buildings where the uh, shipping companies brought their goods in and these were warehouses where they distributed them and then they were able to load it on local carriages and take them away. Now they're gonna see a nice Liberty ship very soon just for a split second. For some reason uh, it's not open to the public but when the war was going on, World War II, they were, they were the, I guess the Germans were sinking a whole bunch of ships so the United States developed a technique how to build uh, ships basically out of uh, little units and then these called the Liberty ships so they were able to just uh, uh, build those ones in a large numbers you can see it right there it's hiding there it's there I think it's gonna be just like a, just like the submarine museum was so you can actually go on it but for now I guess it's closed or maybe they're working on it to make it more user friendly for the uh, tourists but that's an actual Liberty ship, not too many uh, left over, you can see it there. They were actually carrying cargo for Europe, so, and also ammunition and other stuff for the war effort. Here you can see these really old warehouses and they all named as a number, so they call them piers because they have a really long pier where the ships were able to dock and they just uh, give them a number. This is where you can actually leave for the Alcatraz. Alcatraz is an island prison which closed in 1961. And uh, as a tourist, you can actually visit that prison. And this is where the, uh, the uh, little boat leaves, where it goes take you out to the island. You can do the tour of the old prison. And there are several movies about this uh, prison called Alcatraz, which you might want to see. There's one with Clint Eastwood. And apparently uh, some people try to escape. Uh, it's an urban legend that some actually made it, most of them didn't, but that's another story. Most of the time these trams are practically empty, but because uh, most of the people choose a different kind of transportation, but right now it looks pretty full. So now we are passing by, it sort of looked like a kids museum where kids can go in and do stuff. And as we move forward you can see the Bay Bridge, this is not the Golden Gate Bridge. That's a double-decker bay bridge. Uh, on, on one level, the traffic goes one way and underneath goes the other. It connects the bay area with San Francisco. And then there's another uh, large uh, building coming up soon, and that's gonna be the main ferry terminal. That's where the uh, little boats are leaving out from and then go to the bay area. And you can actually, instead of going on the bridge, you can just uh, work in the city, then you walk over to the, uh, the boats and then you basically, it, it takes you over to the other side of the bay where you can go home and live there. The last time I crossed that bridge was with a 1971 Buick station wagon. 
towing a Quack Aero East German camper. You guys probably seen my uh, little film with the Wartburg with the Quack Aero camper behind it. Now we actually made the mistake of coming into the city with that little camper because there was nowhere to park. So we did the sights with the kids and then uh, after that we were out of here. And then went and started heading up north on uh, basically Highway 101 following the uh, ocean. And that was a really memorable trip with my kids. My kids don't remember it because they were too small, but uh, I really liked that, uh, liked that trip what we done that time. So now you're going to be able to see the uh, ferry terminal. They, made that, they fixed up that terminal building and basically made it to a little marketplace where you can buy food and other goodies. And then uh, while you wait for your little boat to take you over to the other side of the uh, bay area. And you can see the bay bridge very nicely in these uh, lights as, it, as the lights come on. Now as we're passing the ferry terminal, the other conductor is saying that this tram will not go further so I'm gonna have to get off of it. Normally it actually goes pretty far so you, it's a very reliable transportation. If you go uh, in San Francisco you can either go with this tram, go around the hill or you can just take the cable car and go across the hill. Either one is good. You can buy a, a day pass and it's about $13 for tourists and with that day pass you can sit on pretty much anything inside the city limits. You can really sit on the BART, which is like a longer train that takes you out to the airport, but you can take the, the cable car, take this tram, or take the buses, or anything else. So that's a really, uh, really free you up to, to take any kind of public transportation. Now, so I'm going to get off the, uh, that beautiful vintage tram. Now we're going to be in the middle of the financial district. So as we are walking through, I made some nice video. I'm going to put some music next to it. I really appreciate if you guys got this far in the video. I know it was not about cars, but also I like any kind of transportation stuff. So I like the tram, I like the submarine, I also like ships and pretty much whatever moves or flies or floats. So thank you for watching and uh, see you guys uh, next Friday with something else. Bye.